try to find out. Uh, you, you put advert in the paper, have you come across this person or that person. We went to the station when new people came in and eventually we got a letter from the Red Cross. Um, Otto Frank and we both, Otto heard that both his girls and his wife had died. And we heard as well from the Red Cross that both my father and brother had died in Mauthausen, this terrible Austrian death camp, several days before the American army came to liberate that camp. So you can imagine all our hopes that we would be a family again was shattered. And Otto Frank as well, when he left, he looked like a ghost. He was 57 years old at the time. And I sat on my mother's lap and we cried. And my mother said, well, we have each other, but this poor man has really nothing left in his life. It was an anomaly that when you and your mother returned to Amsterdam, you, you were able to return to your apartment. That's not something that was the norm. No, that was again very exceptional because we came late in 1940 to Amsterdam without having been able to bring anything with us. And so we had a furnished apartment which belonged to a non-Jewish person. And um, she let us back in again. Otto Frank uh, in his apartment, also people had moved in and the furniture had been taken to Germany. And um, you know, he had nothing. And he stayed with me, Gies. If you'd read the diary, you might remember there were four helpers two women and two men, and Meep Gies was actually one of the main helpers, and Otto went to stay with her. How did your mother and Otto Frank get reacquainted? Um, well, Otto, uh, Meep was having a baby in a small apartment, so he felt he was in the way there, mm -hmm. and so he went uh, around to all the people who had known his girls to try to hear stories about them. and. Um, 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 Otto came back, um, well, many, many months after the end of the war, and Mieb Gies had found the diary after the Germans had arrested the family. And um, she thought, I'll give it back to Anne. And when Otto came back, not knowing yet that Anne wouldn't come back, he didn't give it to him. Only when, he heard, when she heard that Otto knew that Anne wouldn't come back, did she give it to him. And he was amazed at the diary. He came to us, um, he had it in a brown parcel with a string, and uh, he opened it very, very carefully, and he said, um, can I read you something? You'll be amazed. And he started reading, but after two, three lines, he burst into tears. Mm -hmm. It took him three weeks to read it. And um, he was very, very proud of it, and um, he showed it to everybody and discuss it. People said to him, you should publish it. But he was in two minds because the diary is very private and he wasn't sure if Anne wanted it published or not. Mm -hmm. But um, so he asked us as well, I mean, I didn't have an opinion about it, I must admit. But my mother said, well, it's, it's your daughter's work and I'm sure the world would appreciate it. And so many people advised him and eventually he did publish it. But you know, after the war, everybody had suffered, people wanted to move on. And um, only when it was published in America by Doubleday um, in 1952 uh, did it become a bestseller. Otto offered it to many, many American publishers and nobody wanted to take it. And eventually Doubleday said, well, all right, we take a chance on it. And you know, they must have sold at least 20 million copies. So all the other publishers would have been very upset that For they sure. missed this opportunity. By the way, you read the diary. What did you think of it when you first well, read when it? Well, when I read it first, uh, with the Dutch edition, when it came out, I said, well, so what? You know, I went through the same. I must say, I didn't quite get it. I was not in a mood and I was not, um, um, to realize the depths of her thoughts. And I think, you know, um, I mean, I was actually 16 by then, but I had missed three years of school, so I was really more with the um, knowledge of a 13-year-old. 
and I was still very disturbed, so I must say I wasn't really impressed. <laughs> Only much later, when I reread it, and um, I realized that, you know, she wrote things with actually more a, a person perhaps of 18 or 20 might think about. So, um, and that is really what Otto valued in the diary as well. The thoughts with his little girl had already at this early age. Um, well, and Otto came very often to our house. I was very, very depressed, very miserable. And Otto, who had lost everything, told me, you know, you can't go through your life hating people. You'll be a very, very miserable person. Go out, you will see there are some wonderful people around. Well, it was easier said than done, but um, I tried my best. I went back to school, but I couldn't relate to my school friends. I thought I'm an adult by now. And um, when I finished school, I had no idea what to do with my life. And Otto, um, if you go a bit into the story of Anna Frank, Otto took many, many, many pictures of his girls with a very good camera, the Leica, one of the best ones. And Otto said to me one day, um, well, Otto and my mother decided I should become a photographer. And I didn't really care. Um, <laughs> and um, whatever they would have said, I would have said, OK. I wasn't enthusiastic about it. And Otto said, um, I have no family anymore, and I won't take any more pictures. And he gave me his Leica. And he said, I hope you'll be a successful photographer with that. And so I still have this Leica, and I did become a photographer. Um, but I was still very, very miserable in Amsterdam. And Otto knew somebody in London who had a photographic studio. And he sent me there, and I became an apprentice there for a year. And Otto and your mother fell in love and got married in um, 1953. Well, not quite, not quite. Not quite. <laughs> <laughs> I'm that, rushing that, the story. That didn't go so quickly. So I was gone for a year, and um, I um, lived in a little boarding house, um, and that became a young man from Israel to study economics. And, um, um, you know, in England at that time, they didn't like any foreigners. We were bloody foreigners. So um, it was difficult to make friends, but with this boy from Israel, uh, we both didn't have any money, we went for long walks, and after six months he said to me, Eva, I fall in love with you, will you marry me, and we could start a new life and go to Israel. And I said to him, no, thank you. <laughs> because I have a widowed mother in Amsterdam, and you can imagine we were very, very, very close. And um, when my year is over here, I'm going back to her. And, um, well, he thought, well, perhaps a bit later. And, you know, I was stateless. I told him I was Dutch. He told me he was Israeli, which he wasn't. He was really German, a German refugee. We didn't talk about who we were, you know? But nevertheless, um, he wanted to marry me. And um, then Otto came, he kept a bit an eye on me, and he came over to London, and I told him, I met this boy, I quite like him, and um, he asked me to marry him, but I said, of course, no. And then Otto became a bit embarrassed. He said, well, you know, your mother and me have fallen in love as well, and once you get settled, we like to get married. <laughs> so, uh, I went back to this young man and said, well, you can marry me now. <laughs> Everyone loves and, a love story. And we did. We went immediately to Holland because we didn't really know many people in, in London. We got married in 1952, and Otto and my mother got married a year later in 1953. And they were married for 27 years, and they worked continuously on the, to something to do with the publication of the diaries. It was published in 70 languages, and they got an enormous correspondence with some um, people who had read the diaries, especially young girls wanting to know more. Um, if those girls got married later and had a little girl, they called it Anne, and Otto and my mother became the got parents, and so um, they traveled as well very, very much to America, to Israel, 
Um, and then a film was made and a play was made and the uh, Anne Frank story became bigger and bigger and bigger. You must have felt at times very much overshadowed by Aunt Anne when they were busy promoting the book. What was it like? Well, whenever I was introduced by Otto, by my mother, by anybody, it was not who I was, it was always that's Anne Frank's stepsister. <laughs> and I, I really didn't like it, you know? I said, well, I'm a, I'm a person, my own right. I did quite well, I had got married, I had three daughters, um, I was a good mother, I was a photographer, and um, later I had an antique shop, and um, you know, nobody took any notice of me, of who I was, what I had gone through, and never talked about my experience. But then I thought, you know, I have a life, I have children, I have a husband, um, and this Anna has nothing. So, okay, I'm going to be Anna Frank's stepsister. <laughs> so I accepted that. I mentioned earlier that we have copies of your father and brother's paintings in our lobby. And I know you were very close to your brother Heinz, and that he was a very talented musician, poet, um, artist. Tell us about him and his music and his poetry and his paintings. Talk about Heinz. Um, well, he was really a musician. My grandfather was as well a, a wonderful musician. And already when he was four years old, he put Heinz on his lap and started to teach him piano. And he just took to it like a duck to water. He had the perfect ear. If you, if you heard the melody, he could play it. Um, when he was a little bit older, he could play um, Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue, which is a very difficult mm -hmm. piece of music by heart. He could just play it. Mm -hmm. And um, he had a guitar, he had an accordion, he had some, many instruments. He could just play anything. And, um, but of course, in hiding, you had to be completely silent. And um, so my father, said, well, why don't you start painting? Um, that is something you can do quietly. And Hans said, well, no, I can't paint. My father said, well, let's just try together to encourage him. And um, they were able to get oil paintings. Um, those are, of course, copies, so they're on a cardboard. But some of the paintings are on a dishcloth because you couldn't get any um, proper linen for, for oil paintings you put on linen. And so that was lucky, you know, an oil painting had to be on a wooden frame, had to be pinned on, and then, um, then you did your painting. But, and the wood they couldn't get, so they took each linen bit off and um, pinned up a new linen, a dishcloth or a piece of sheet or whatever they could get. And when they escaped from this woman who hit them um, and blackmailed them, before they escaped there, they hid the painting under the floorboards. You will see the note which they put on it, with grease on it from the oil, um, that it belongs to Heinz and Eric Geringer, and after the war, they will come and pick it up again. And the last conversation I had with Heinz was in the cattle truck, where he told me that, that the, he, his paintings are in this house under the floorboards, and he told me exactly where they were. And after Otto got his diary from Anne, I said to my mother, um, well, what about Heinz's painting? We have to get that as well. We have nothing of Heinz. And so we did go there, and indeed we found so certain artworks, which you can imagine we were, of course, overwhelmed with emotions that Heinz had left this behind. And um, we were very lucky to save them. And a few years ago, I donated them to the Resistance Museum because through the Resistance, my mother's life and my life were saved. And as well, they were created in Amsterdam, so I think that was a good place. And, but somebody here in the Quad Cities wanted to make an exhibition and made copies. And um, this is what we have got here now. And they've been going to many different cities in America. And so, you know, Anne says in her diary, one of the things she says, when she dies, she would like to become immortal, meaning she would carry on with life. Um, of course, 
not she, but her memory will not be forgotten. And that, I think, is what we all want. If we have lived here, we don't want just that nobody knows that we have existed. And Heinz being so artistic and so um, sensitive, when he was 12 years old, he saw already around him people were rounded up and disappeared and were killed. And um, so one day he said to me, um, what will happen when we'll die? Will we just disappear and frightened? So I said, well, I don't know. Let's ask our father who has answers to everything. Mm -hmm. So that is, you have to answer all the questions your child are asking you. And um, so he went to him and he said, what, what will happen when we die? And my father said, well, of course, your body will go. But when you have children, you will live on in your children. And then this 12-year-old boy says, but what if I die before I have any children? And my father thought a minute and he said, well, nothing gets lost. We are all a link in a big chain which goes from generation to generation. And whatever you have done, somebody will remember. So you will never be forgotten. So um, I wrote another book, which unfortunately we haven't got anymore here. It's called The Promise. That is about Heinz. And um, so I feel, and through the paintings, and as well, he wrote many, many poems. They're in Dutch. We have some translated, some are in the book. But um, I'm trying to get more translated so he won't be forgotten. And this is what I think is the most important thing for every human being. So, um, why did you keep your story a secret for 41 years, not speaking about it until 1986? Um, well, I didn't keep it a secret, but it was so horrendous. First of all, I didn't want to burden my children with it. You know, I can imagine if you know that your mother had gone through terrible, terrible suffering and life, um, you know, you feel sorry and you don't really want to know about it. And um, so that's why I didn't tell. And it wasn't just me. All Holocaust survivors didn't speak till much, much later. Um, and that was when we realized the world really hadn't learned anything. When we came back, first of all, people didn't want to hear at that time. And secondly, um, the people were really, everybody had suffered and people realized that we have to change, we have to get different attitudes, and the motto was never again Auschwitz. We have learned our lesson from now on. We will live in harmony, in peace. Um, we won't be uh, discriminating and on. But you know, this lasted, it did last for a while, perhaps 20 years, but um, there was the 60s with the flower people, everybody was loving each other, you know, uh, with lovely songs about love and all that. But um, in the meantime, we had the Vietnamese War and the Korean War and the Cambodia killings and on and on and on and on. And now again, we are in the Syria and in Iraq and Libya. Um, millions of people are um, bombed out of their homes. Every day you hear bombing about 100 people killed, 50 people killed, even in Western Europe. In England, we had already now, in the last several months, five terrorist attacks. In France, terrible things. In Germany, terrible things. So the world really doesn't look very good. And um, so it is really very, very important to talk about it and not make the same mistake as the Germans to be bystanders. We have a voice, we are still a democracy, and we must make use of our rights to tell our government what we want. Here, here. <laughs> Eva, last night we saw the play down at the community theater, and then they came for me, remembering the world of Anne Frank. How has this place worldwide reaction or reception impacted you? You told me you've seen it a thousand times. Um, in 1995, an American playwright approached me. Um, he was commissioned to write a play. Um, they did in a theater, the Diary of Anne Frank, and people wanted to know more. 
um, that was in 1995. So um, very few people really knew details about the Holocaust, but they knew Anne Frank's story, but they were interested in knowing more. It wasn't just Anne Frank, there must have been many, many other uh, people who had gone through terrible things. And um, so they wanted a new play being written, um, but still connected to Anne Frank, so they were looking for people who had their own story, but were connected to Anne Frank. And they came up with my story and with um, uh, Ed, Silverberg. Ed Silverberg, who was one of Anne's boyfriends, she writes about him. And um, so we were asked if he would uh, be willing to um, be uh, people in a play, and we were both very willing about it. And this play was, cre um, was created, um, was first performed in 1996 in New Brunswick, and um, it was an educational play, it was going into school, it's a one hour play, and it became an immediate success. Um, it's done in many, many schools, high schools have done it, um, theaters do it, uh, well, it's, it's just worldwide. I've been with it in Australia, I've been with it in China, in uh, South America, in Germany, in France, England, and a lot, of course, in America. I think I've been in most states. And it won awards for best educational play. And um, <coughs> um, it's been going now for 20 years. And um, here it is for the second time and um, yesterday was the first production, and it's done by young people. It's really, really, a really very moving and um, beautiful story. From what I know about you, <laughs> you've refused to let your losses define you. You've remained appreciative and positive despite losing your father and your brother, and in some ways your mother when she took on Otto Frank's quest to publicize the diary. Um, I just don't know how you've been able to overcome these difficult circumstances. Can you talk a little bit about that? Finish up with that? Well, I was basically, as a child, I was a very happy and optimistic child. And for 40 years, I was looking to find me again. Mm -hmm. And I, I was struggling. I really was struggling for a long, long time. And, but you know, I love nature. I love people, and with traveling through the world, I've met some wonderful, wonderful people. So I got back my confidence, I got back my love of people, I got back my love for nature, and I realized that, yeah, life is not meant to be just smooth and easy. I think everybody um, has good periods and bad periods, but it is well worth to persist get over the bad periods because at the end will always be a rainbow. And um, it turns out it is true, you know. Um, nobody goes through their life having all bad luck. Um, there are a lot of wonderful things happening. And um, especially if you are outgoing, if you start to get interested in other people, get to know other people, um, travel a little bit. There's so much beauty, so much wonderful things in our planet. We are blessed with a beautiful, wonderful planet and we must look after it very, very, very carefully and not destroy it. The last thing that I'm going to ask you about before we move on to a Q&A is Steven Spielberg has started a new project through the Shoah Foundation in California. Um, he's creating holograms, and he has asked a select few survivors to be part of this project, and you are one of the few. Could you discuss this project and what the interview pro process was like? Um, yes. Um, last year, year, I was asked if I would take part in a very, very important project meaning that um, we all know that we are not here forever on this earth and who is going to carry on telling the story and um, teach the Holocaust to the new generation who will grow up. And they came up in California with making holograms and they explained to me, um, we will um, send for you to come to California. Um, 
you're going to sit in a in a huge round cage, huge. Um, there will be 116 cameras attached to this round bowl. Um, there will be, I don't know, uh, 250 little light bulbs. You will sit in it um, for 10 days. Um, we'll get special clothes for you that you will wear that every day, shoes, everything. Um, what color would you like? I said blue. They couldn't find it in blue, so I got it in gray, um, <laughs> which I was a little bit upset, but I said, well, okay. <laughs> and um, they are going to ask me for as long as it takes, it took 10 days, um, um, a thousand questions about my life, everything, all my experiences, and I have to sit completely immobile there every day. They took a photo, how I was sitting, how I had my feet, how I had my hand. So every day they checked it with a, with a photograph. I know it was all very technical. And um, so and outside the cage, they were sitting there and asking me questions. And um, there's now um, and another person was filming this whole process. Um, from, from the hotel in the morning, um, going to breakfast, taking a car, going to this venue, um, getting dressed in the clothes, sitting in that, in that cage, um, and how it started, the f questions and so on. They took about a thousand hours of, of filming, and this film is now released, and it is 15 minutes. <laughs> um, and it's going to be shown now in New York, and they're going, um, the, um, I think it's going to be shown now in the Jewish Museum there, but there will be a debate and um, discussion, and it will be a big release about it. In um, 6th of December, I'm going to go to New York um, to talk about this project. And the purpose is that um, in 30, 50, 100 years, um, when I will go um, into a school, um, so children or the adults or whoever will ask me a question and I will answer it, sounding as if I'm really sitting there telling it. So that's a really quite an amazing, amazing project. Eva, despite growing up in what was far from a wonderful world, you had two prosperous businesses in photography and antiques. You and your husband's V were married 64 years before he died in 2016. You raised three happy daughters. You have five grandchildren. At age 88, you speak all over the world. <laughs> you are an inspiration to all of us and our Viterbo and our community. Thank you for sharing your story.